36-year-old Joshua Lee Webb decapitated his mother, Tina Marie, on May the 14th of 2017 before stepping into a supermarket in Clackamas County, Oregon, with the severed head in hand and stabbing a clerk. Webb, who suffered from severe vision problems and lived with his parents at the family's rural home, murdered the 59-year-old woman on Mother's Day for reasons unknown. Following the matricide, he wandered into Estacada Harvest Market and stabbed Michael Wagner, one of the store's employees. Wagner, who was 66, survived the attack, in large part due to the assistance of his co-workers, who estranged Webb until police arrived. The victim was taken to the hospital where he was treated for his wounds. Meanwhile, Webb's sister frantically called 911 as she discovered her mother's body, along with the remains of her brother's dog. Webb's father, David, had been away from the house at the time of the killing. The suspect was examined by two psychiatrists after his arrest and was diagnosed with both schizophrenia and psychosis. Although he began taking medication following the diagnosis, he still reported hearing voices in his head a year after the attacks. Webb was found guilty by reason of insanity on June the 26th of 2018 and was committed to a mental hospital. Under Oregon law, he would be evaluated every two years by the Psychiatry Review Board to determine if and when he would be released. Relatives of both victims expressed their dissatisfaction with the sentence. Number 16. Andrew Wilson 19-year-old Andrew Wilson, a resident of Williamston, Michigan, murdered his mother, Lisa, on September the 8th of 2017 after she forbade him from keeping a puppy. The victim, aged 51, had reportedly argued with her son after he attempted to adopt a dog. Wilson subsequently waited until his mother went to bed to shoot her in the back of the head as she slept. He called 911 at 7 o'clock the following morning, claiming he'd returned home to find his mother already dead. When police arrived at the scene, however, they made the determination that nobody other than Wilson and his mother had been inside the house that night. Detectives eventually discovered that the murder weapon had been the family's 22 Magnum rifle, which was kept in a locked cabinet. Wilson was believed to have driven around the neighborhood and discarded the weapon before calling 911. His diagnosis of major depressive disorder during the ensuing trial was instrumental in reducing his charges from first degree to second degree murder. Judge Clinton Canada III ultimately sentenced him to between 17 and 24 years in prison following his conviction. Number 15. Brian Peck On October the 17th of 2017, days after 76-year-old Gail Peck was reported missing, her son Brian was arrested for murdering her. The 55-year-old Illinois man initially told police his mother had gone out for a walk with her dog. Although the animal managed to find its way back home on its own, Gail never returned. Police discovered the elderly woman's remains in a duffel bag. With the help of a community emergency response team, Brian became the investigation's prime suspect when traces of blood were found at the Peck family's residence and footage recovered from a Home Depot showed him purchasing tarps, nylon cord, and paver bricks. He also bought a duffel bag and steam cleaner at Walmart the following day, paying for his purchases with $4,000 he'd transferred from his mother's checking account. The man was believed to have dismembered his mother and disposed of her body in a lagoon. He was arrested and charged with premeditated murder, as well as concealment of a homicidal death. Brian admitted to killing his mother but claimed he'd acted in self-defense. According to his testimony, they'd had an argument over the volume at which he played his music. The dispute eventually escalated after Gail demanded her son move out at which point she allegedly grabbed a knife to attack him. The prosecution rejected Brian's version of events, contending he'd acted with premeditation. In 2022, he was sentenced to 62 years in prison. Number 14. Stephen Pratt Two days after being released from prison and returning home to Atlantic City, New Jersey, Stephen Pratt murdered his mother, 64-year-old Gwendolyn Pratt, on October the 12th of 2014, the 45-year-old man had been incarcerated since 1986 when he was found guilty of fatally shooting his neighbor, Michael Anderson, at the age of 15. Though Pratt's family had just thrown him a welcome party, he contacted one of his cousins to ask whether he could stay at their house over the weekend, indicating he'd had an argument with his mother. When law enforcement caught wind 
of what Pratt had done and went to arrest him. He didn't resist. He decided to plead guilty during his first court hearing, stating he didn't want the case to go to trial. In the end, Pratt was sentenced to 25 years behind bars for the murder. Number 13. Jeffrey Jordan 32-year-old Jeffrey Jordan, the son of basketball icon Michael Jordan, was taken to the hospital on September the 20th of 2021 after slipping and hitting his head against a table at Casa Amigos, a bar in Scottsdale, Arizona. Upon arrival at the hospital, Jordan began exhibiting hostility towards the medical staff and even assaulted some of the employees. Although the specific circumstances of the attack weren't disclosed to the public, the incident made national headlines, in no small part due to his father's prodigious fame. The young man, who played college basketball at the University of Illinois and later at the University of Central Florida but never made it to the pros, was charged with one count of aggravated assault against healthcare professionals following his subsequent arrest. Number 12. Elijah D. Smith On September the 18th of 2021, Elijah D. Smith gunned down his mother, singer Latoya Acree, in the driveway of her home in Spotsylvania, Virginia. 41-year-old Acree, who was preparing to perform at an event to raise awareness for domestic violence, ultimately succumbed to a gunshot wound to her upper body. Mother and son had reportedly been arguing leading up to the attack. After shooting his mother, 21-year-old Smith fled the scene. He was found at a motel by police and was arrested on charges of second-degree murder. The culprit had been out on bond awaiting criminal proceedings for a separate incident for which he'd been charged with assault and battery. Smith was found guilty in January of 2023 and although he hadn't been sentenced yet, as of the latest updates, he faced up to 43 years behind bars as potential punishment. Number 11. Gregory Logan Ramos Florida student Gregory Logan Ramos fatally strangled his mother, 45-year-old Gail Elaine Clevenger, on November the 2nd of 2018. The young man then reportedly hid her body outside a DeBarry church. Two of the underage criminal's friends were charged with accessories after the fact as well. Ramos had argued with his mother over a bad grade at school, leading to a violent altercation that culminated in Clevenger's death. Initially, Ramos called 911 and reported that someone had broken into their house and committed the murder while he was at school. Detectives, however, grew suspicious of the young man after noticing scratches on his face. Ramos provided conflicting accounts about how he'd been injured, telling his father he'd fallen down a flight of stairs while claiming to have gotten into a fight at school when questioned by police. He eventually admitted to the murder and to burying his mother's remains by the River City Church's fire pit with the help of 20-year-old Brian Porras and Dylan Keglarik, aged 19. Each of the suspects was ultimately tried as an adult. Ramos pleaded guilty on December the 9th of 2020 in order to avoid a life sentence. Instead, he was sentenced to 45 years and could be paroled after 25. Number 10. Brian Spence Shortly before 9 a.m. on March the 2nd of 2020, police were called to the scene of an abandoned car near Jenks East Elementary School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Upon arrival, law enforcement found rifles inside the vehicle, as well as documents containing the address of a home near East 88th Street and Braden Avenue. Officers went to the house, which was found to be emanating the strong odor of gas. The authorities subsequently evacuated nearby homes as firefighters and a hazmat crew geared up to make entry. After doing so, emergency personnel came upon the lifeless bodies of Beverly and Joseph Spence, both of whom had sustained fatal gunshot wounds. Following further investigation, the slain couple's adult son, Brian, was identified as a suspect. Investigators uncovered that the 40-year-old had deleted text conversations with his father about delinquent debts. Brian reportedly owed Joseph roughly $17,000, a fact he later admitted to the police. He likewise confessed to gunning down his parents, then leaving their home's natural gas on in the hopes of an explosion, which he thought would eliminate his financial troubles. Brian was booked into the Tulsa County Jail on two counts of first-degree murder, to which he ultimately pleaded guilty. In November of 2020, the man was sentenced to a pair of consecutive life terms. Number 9. Stephen Burks 
27-year-old Stephen Burks severely injured his mother, Karen Jeffley, and murdered her fiancé on January the 6th of 2023 at the home they shared in Houston, Texas. Burks reportedly shot the couple following a heated argument. When police arrived at the scene, they encountered the suspect, who was still armed with a gun. Jeffley was rushed to the hospital where she was treated for her injuries, though, as of the latest developments, her condition remained delicate. Her fiancé was declared dead at the scene. Burks was charged with aggravated assault and murder. His bond was set at $1 million and, if released, he would remain under house arrest while awaiting the case's legal proceedings. Number 8. Kit Darren Miami high schooler Kit Darren ultimately admitted to murdering his mother, 35-year-old Renette Emile, on March the 27th of 2012. According to subsequent reports on the matter, the young man had even hosted a party at the family home while her remains were still inside. Darren strangled his mother after a heated argument before stabbing her over 100 times with a butcher knife. Following the murder, he covered Emile's body with sheets and laundry detergent and invited friends for a get-together at their residence. Darren had been suffering from psychological issues, which had resulted in other concerning incidents leading up to his mother's killing. During one such episode, he reportedly jumped out of a moving car, then proceeded to rush directly into traffic. Darren lived with his mother's corpse for several days before police arrived at the apartment, responding to a call placed by Emile's boyfriend, who'd grown worried after not hearing from her. In 2015, the young man was sentenced to 28 years in prison for the murder. Number 7. Daniel Petrich Ohio teen Daniel Petrich led a fairly average adolescent life until he contracted a staph infection from a skiing injury which rendered him housebound for a year while he recovered from acute spinal damage. During that time, his friend Jonathan Johnson introduced him to the Halo video games and he subsequently developed an addiction to playing them. Reports described Daniel playing the game for upwards of eight hours every day at Johnson's house. Daniel reportedly wanted to purchase a copy of the game for himself, but his father, Mark, disapproved of its depiction of violence and therefore forbade him from playing it ever again. The teen flouted his father's orders and tried to smuggle a copy of Halo 3 into the family's Wellington home. Mark caught him, however, and confiscated the game, placing it in a safe that also contained a 9mm handgun. On October the 20th of 2007, roughly a week after the video game was locked away, Daniel went rummaging through his father's things and eventually unearthed the key to the safe. He extracted both the game and the firearm, then proceeded to shoot both his parents as they sat on the couch in the living room. Daniel's mother, Susan, succumbed to the gunshot wounds she sustained to the head, chest, and arms. Daniel then placed the gun in his critically injured father's hands to make it appear as though he'd actually committed the shooting. Minutes later, Daniel's sister Heidi and her husband Andrew arrived at the home two hours earlier than they'd planned, causing the teen to panic. He initially refused to open the door, but when Heidi heard one of her parents groaning, she and Andrew forced their way inside. Daniel subsequently fled in the family van, but was pulled over and arrested while en route to a friend's house. Mark ultimately survived, so his son faced charges of aggravated murder and attempted aggravated murder. In court, the prosecution tried portraying the teen as a heartless killer who'd meticulously planned his parents' killings in retaliation for having his copy of Halo 3 taken away. While being psychologically evaluated, Daniel admitted to plotting the murder over the course of the week that preceded it. Daniel's legal team, meanwhile, attempted to argue the insanity defense, claiming the young man had been under considerable stress due to the skiing injury, which in turn made him susceptible to being influenced by video game violence. In the end, Daniel was found guilty of his charges and was consequently sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 23 years. Number 6. Aaron Matthew On September the 11th of 2021, 54-year-old Ingrid Matthew was murdered by her teenage son Aaron at her home in Leicester, East Midlands, England. Aaron, who was 19 at the time, stabbed his mother repeatedly before slitting her throat and fleeing the scene. She died from massive blood loss while lying on her bedroom floor, where she was discovered by her former partner and Aaron's father, Andrew Marshall. 
The young man surrendered himself to the police the morning after the incident, whereupon he was charged with first-degree murder. During the criminal trial, the defense team argued that doctors had failed to diagnose Aaron with autistic spectrum disorder, which allegedly prevented him from controlling his impulses. The young man pleaded guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. He was sentenced to life in prison, although he could be paroled after serving a minimum of just six years. Today's topic was requested by Dove Master, IC Fee, Two Chooks and Sunshine, Moon and Flowers. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 5. Jack Din On the morning of December the 23rd of 2022, 54-year-old Tai Din was found dead at his home on the 1200 block of Snyder Avenue in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Local police revealed that the man's body had been stuffed inside a freezer in the basement of the residence with a bag over his head. As the homicide investigation got underway, detectives spoke with a neighbor who happened to be walking their dog. Early on the morning, Ty's body was found. The witness reported hearing a horrifying cry for help from inside the Din household. Some of Ty's relatives subsequently conducted a welfare check on him whereupon they came across blood and a knife and notified the authorities. In early January of 2023, it was reported that the police had identified a suspect in the case, the victim's 27-year-old son, Jack. The latter was taken into custody and charged with murder, possessing instruments of crime and abuse of a corpse as he awaited the next steps of the case's legal proceedings. Number 4. Track Palin the son of former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin was arrested on domestic violence charges in September of 2018. According to the police, 29-year-old Track Palin was involved in a physical altercation with a female acquaintance at his home in Wasilla, Alaska. State troopers arrived at the house at about 10.37 p.m. after receiving a report about a disturbance. It emerged that Track had taken away the alleged victim's cell phone in order to prevent her from calling the police. He then physically resisted the officers as they attempted to handcuff him. He was held at the Matsu pretrial facility in Palmer without bond on charges of domestic violence, interfering with a report of domestic violence, resisting arrest and disorderly conduct. The incident occurred on the heels of another domestic episode at the Palin family residence in December of 2017. Track had reportedly gotten into a heated confrontation with his father, Todd, after breaking into his parents' house over a dispute about a pickup truck, Todd, who'd armed himself with a gun in anticipation of his son's arrival, was tackled to the ground and repeatedly punched in the head before ultimately escaping. At the time, Track was on probation for a previous domestic violence arrest stemming from an incident with his then-girlfriend in January of 2016. For the attack on his father, he pleaded guilty to first-degree criminal trespass avoiding an assault charge and a potential one-year jail sentence in exchange for attending an intense therapeutic program offered to U.S. veterans. As a result of his most recent arrest, however, Track became ineligible for the program and was instead ordered to spend a year in custody either at a halfway house or in jail. Number 3. Sandy Lewis's Son on November the 20th of 2014, Sandy Lewis's husband received a call from their 24-year-old son, informing him he'd murdered the 53-year-old woman at their Detroit residence. The father immediately called 911 before rushing to the house where his son was waiting. Inside, he found his wife's body on the kitchen floor with multiple stab wounds. He restrained his son until police arrived and took him into custody. The young man, whose name wasn't released to the media, was taken to the hospital, where he was treated for a deep laceration. Although the reason for the murder remained undetermined, police theorized Lewis's son had stabbed her as a result of an argument and an unspecified mental illness. Number 2. Henri Van Breda In January of 2015, a wealthy South African family was brutally attacked at their luxury villa on the Dizalza Winelands Golf Estate at Stellenbosch. The assault occurred during the early morning hours of the 27th and ultimately claimed the lives of millionaire property developer Martin Van Breda, his wife, 
former IBM computer scientist Teresa and their eldest son Rudy. The couple's daughter, Marley, survived but was left in a coma as a result of her near-deadly injuries and underwent several months of intensive physiotherapy in the aftermath. The Van Breda's younger son, Henri, only suffered minor superficial wounds. As was detailed in subsequent reports, the assailant had been armed with an axe during the course of the attack and had inflicted at least 17 wounds to the victim's skulls and necks. While being interviewed by the police, Henri indicated he'd sustained his relatively light injuries during a life or death struggle with the purported attacker, whom he described as a masked intruder. As the investigation progressed, however, suspicions began to fall upon Henri the only Van Breda who hadn't been killed or critically injured that fateful night. One of the initial red flags was the fact that multiple hours had passed following the supposed home invasion before he contacted the authorities. Furthermore, there were no signs of an intruder at the estate, which was outfitted with perimeter electric fencing and security gates, as well as CCTV and 24-hour dog patrols. The affluent family's villa exhibited no evidence of forced entry and nothing had been stolen. Henri maintained his innocence while rumors began to circulate about a feud that had begun to burgeon between him and his parents in the period leading up to their deaths. The young man had allegedly developed an addiction to drugs, and his parents eventually cut him off from the allowance they'd previously paid him. After a year and a half of uncertainty, law enforcement finally gathered enough evidence to arrest Henri for the triple homicide of his parents and brother, as well as the vicious attack on his sister. In April of 2017, the case's legal proceedings commenced at Western Cape High Court, with him entering a plea of not guilty. The following May, however, Henri was convicted of murder, attempted murder, and obstruction of justice. He was given three consecutive life prison terms, plus an additional 16 years. As a consequence of his incarceration, Henri missed out on the multi-million dollar inheritance that had served as his primary motive in the first place. The estate was instead inherited in full by Marley, the sole survivor of her brother's attack. Before we continue, it's not only sons that can go wrong, but daughters too. Check out our earlier release on that coming right up. Number 1. William Josephus Warden On November the 3rd of 2018, only a week after the devastating Pittsburgh synagogue shooting, a young man from Cary, North Carolina made threats against a local synagogue. William Josephus Warden, the son of prominent former Court of Appeals judge Lucy Inman, reportedly rang the door at congregation Shah Ari Shalom and made hostile remarks towards the individual who answered. In addition to issuing threats, Warden made a number of disparaging statements against the Jewish religion and people of the Jewish faith. It was revealed that the young man had also distributed anti-Semitic literature, which included a swastika in the words Aryan Youth, in the area of Roblin Lane in Cary. The paper flyers he handed out reportedly featured a link to a SoundCloud channel containing numerous songs bearing titles which suggested a strong anti-Semitic and anti-African ideology. Furthermore, Warden was accused of erecting a cross at Bond Park in Cary, which he then set ablaze in January of 2020. Then, 21-year-old Warden pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor charge of ethnic intimidation. He was told to abide by the terms of his unsupervised probation for a period of a year, during which time he was ordered to attend a psychiatric treatment program in Florida. Number 6. Jennifer Pan In 2010, three men made their way into the Pan residence in Unionville, Markham, Ontario, home to Vietnamese immigrants Bic Ha Pan, Hue Han Pan, and their 24-year-old daughter, Jennifer, on November the 8th. The intruders entered through the unlocked front door, demanded all the money in the house, then took Bick and Han to the basement and shot them multiple times. Bick died at the scene and Han was left in critical condition but ultimately survived. Jennifer was the one who placed the 911 call and she'd later tell officers that after the intruders had tied her up, she'd managed to free her hands and reach for the phone. She was questioned by the police on the night of the murder. As the investigation progressed, there were multiple inconsistencies that detectives had remarked through Jennifer's facade of grief and tearful distress. Among the major irregularities in the violent home invasion was a lack of forced entry and the fact that Jennifer hadn't been blindfolded or taken to the basement and left alive as 
a potential witness, Jennifer was arrested on November the 22nd during her third police interview in which she also revealed the controlling environment under which she lived at home. Under Canadian law, officers are allowed to lie to the suspects they're questioning in order to obtain evidence. The interrogating officer, William Gotts, falsely told Jennifer that the police had special software that could detect untruths in statements. Gutz used the read interrogation technique of creating a high-pressure environment for the interviewee, followed by sympathy and offers of understanding and help. Jennifer eventually admitted to having hired the intruders, but claimed that she'd contracted them to execute her and not her parents. A video with portions of Jennifer's police interviews uploaded to the YouTube channel JCS Criminal Psychology has been viewed over 35 million times. If you could make this decision over, you would change it. Okay? You would change it. Right? Of course. If I knew who was going to get hurt, of course okay. I would. Jen, you knew who was going to get hurt. That's the whole issue here. Okay, that's the whole issue here. You gave them the plan for your parents, right? That's all I need to hear. No. Jen, you did. No, and this is not going to go anywhere because I wanted them to kill me. Tell me what happened. I told you what happened. Okay, all of it. You did. Okay, all you have to do is here is tell me right now that Bill, yes, I made a mistake. Bill, yes, I made a mistake. This plan was for my parents. It ultimately emerged that Jennifer had conspired with her boyfriend, Daniel Chi Kwong Wong, to hire professional hitmen to kill her parents. They calculated that Jennifer stood to inherit $500,000 from their deaths, and it was she who'd left the door open for the intruders. Jennifer also sought revenge on Bick and Han for their tiger parenting, which had reportedly stressed academic, athletic, and artistic achievements, thus depriving her of any social life into her early 20s. It's unclear who acted as the trigger man in the shooting. The others involved were named as David Milverganum, who was confirmed to have entered the house, Lenford Roy Crawford and Eric Sean Carty. Pan, Wong, Milverganum and Crawford were all convicted and given life sentences, with at least 25 years served, while Carty pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and was sentenced to 18 years. Number 5. Natalie Mayer the body of 71-year-old Veronica Korstafin was found in her bed by authorities in Tasmania on October the 29th of 2019. The elderly woman had been killed weeks prior to the body's discovery, and the main suspect was her daughter, Natalie Mayer, aged 48. She hadn't lived with her mother since her late teens, but had moved with Korstafin in Launceston about two months before her death while facing financial difficulties. Investigators and forensic experts determined that Maya had fatally smothered her mother with a pillow on October the 3rd. Within days, she used her credit card to purchase a flight from Launceston to Perth. She then transferred the funds in Korstafin's account, about $12,000, to her own and fled Tasmania with the woman's computer tablet, phone and jewelry. While a factor, money wasn't believed to have been the main motive behind the killing. Maya had reportedly resented her mother since her teens when her parents separated. Once they were again under the same roof, Korstafin began complaining about Maya's excessive drinking and pressed her to change her lifestyle. Maya flew into a fit of rage after finding messages on her mother's phone in which she'd expressed concerns regarding her behavior to others. It's believed that she then, possibly under the influence of alcohol, went to Korstafin's bedroom and suffocated her. Following her arrest and during her criminal trial, Maya maintained her innocence, but in November of 2021, the jury returned a unanimous guilty verdict at Launceston Supreme Court. Maya was sentenced to 23 years in prison with parole available after 13 years served. Number 4. Isabella Guzman In 2020, a video entitled Sweet But Psycho went viral on TikTok, showing a young woman smiling in court while she was facing trial for the brutal murder of her mother. Countless users on the social media platform, along with others in Twitter as well, remarked the contrast between Isabella Guzman's attractive appearance and the horrific crime of which she stood accused. They also noted the lack of remorse she displayed during her legal proceedings, which dated back to 2013. In August of that year, Guzman had butchered her mother, 47-year-old, 
Yun Mi Hoi at their home in Aurora, Colorado. Tensions had been reported in the household leading up to the woman's death and Guzman was allegedly on the verge of being kicked out of the house. She had threatened violence against her mother with part of her rage, reportedly being directed at the woman's new husband, Ryan Hoy, whom she felt was trying to replace her biological father, Robert. Yun Mi had become so fearful of 18-year-old Guzman that she'd asked the latter to talk with her, which he did on August the 28th. Robert felt that he'd gotten through to his daughter, later reporting that she seemed calm and understanding. Roughly three hours later, however, Hoi heard Yun Mi screaming from an upstairs bathroom. As he went to check on her, Hoi caught a glimpse of Guzman in the bathroom before she shut the door and locked it. He then noticed blood flowing underneath the door and went downstairs to call 911. Upon his return, Hoi saw Guzman standing in the bathroom doorway holding a knife. She said nothing and fled the scene as the man fruitlessly tried to revive his wife. Responding officers found Yun Mi's naked body covered in stab wounds and a bloodied baseball bat beside her. An autopsy subsequently revealed that Guzman had stabbed her 151 times and repeatedly struck her with the bat. The team was arrested the day after the attack and was ultimately found not guilty by reason of insanity. It was determined that she suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. Guzman claimed to have heard voices that told her to kill her mother, whom she believed was someone named Cecilia, in order to save the world. The teenager was sent to the Colorado Mental Health Institute at Pueblo, where she was still receiving treatment at the time of the viral video circulation. Number 3. Mary White On August the 5th of 2018, acclaimed Australian paleobotanist Mary Elizabeth White was found dead in her room at a New South Wales Southern Highlands nursing home. Throughout her career, White had received a number of distinctions, was awarded with honorary doctorates from four universities and in 2009 was named a member of the Order of Australia. In the incident's aftermath, it was determined that the 92-year-old woman's death had been caused by drugs, which hadn't been administered by the nursing home staff. Investigators found that Barbara Eckersley, White's daughter, had put substances commonly known as green dream drugs in her mother's soup. The sedatives of the barbiturate class are often used by veterinarians to euthanize animals and Eckersley had had them since her time as a wildlife caregiver in Canberra, roughly two decades prior. The woman admitted to drugging her mother but denied having done so with the intention of killing her. At the time, Eckersley was dealing with severe depression in connection to her mother's health. During her trial, she recounted how White had become immensely distraught as she was aware her mental faculties, afflicted by the dementia, were fading. Eckersley felt that the care facility wasn't doing enough to soothe her mother's suffering and sought to help her by administering the barbiturates that ultimately caused her death. She was initially charged with murder but eventually found guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter. A judge determined that Eckersley's moral culpability was low because of her severe depression. She avoided jail time and was sentenced to a two-year community corrections order with the condition that she undergo mental health treatment. Today's topic was requested by Nidia Pinya. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Gabriela Pereiro In July of 2018, Florida woman Gabriela Pereiro was at the Fort Lauderdale home of her mother, 85-year-old Luisa, of whom she had allegedly been taking care. According to a report by local authorities, Pereiro had learned during the interaction with her mother that she wouldn't get any of her inheritance, which was to be shared among her siblings. Pereiro would later admit in her police interviews that she was overtaken by rage and told her mother, you destroyed my life, so I'm going to destroy you. The 53-year-old ransacked Luisa's condo and smashed picture frames before attacking her. Pereiro pushed her mother to the floor and forcefully yanked on her arms, ripping her skin off. She then grabbed the elderly woman's neck with both hands and began to squeeze. In the attack's aftermath, Pereiro cleaned Luisa up, placed her in a bed and called 911. She told responding officers that she didn't want her mother to die. Luisa spent a day in a coma at Broward Health Medical Center before succumbing to her injuries. Pereiro was charged with premeditated murder and aggravated battery on a person 65 years of age or older. Number 1. Alexis Van Dusen Michigan woman Alexis Van Dusen, aged 21, was taken into custody by police in Kalamazoo. 
after attempting to kill her mother in a methamphetamine-fueled attack. Van Dusen tried to set 51-year-old Buffy McBride on fire with rubbing alcohol prior to stabbing her multiple times with a pocket knife on February the 25th of 2022. As reported by McBride's daughter-in-law and other sources, the woman had tried to help Van Dusen, who was distraught and banging on neighbors' doors. McBride then became the focus of her aggression and was forced to fight for her life. She survived Van Dusen's onslaught and was hospitalized with multiple injuries. In an interview with Fox 10, after her release from the hospital, McBride addressed Van Dusen to say that she loved her and wished her the best. Regarding the attack, she added, that wasn't my daughter. Van Dusen was held on a $200,000 bond on charges of attempted murder and unlawful imprisonment. In early March, she made her first court appearance, during the course of which a judge told her that the crimes of which she stood accused carried a potential life prison sentence. Thanks for watching. If you were assured that your firstborn son would become a serial killer, but your second child would cure cancer, would you decide to have kids? Let us know in the comments section below.